it's me, Jennifer, from Little Metal Boxes, and uh, just wanted to catch up with you guys um, and talk a little bit about magnetic tool helpful tips that uh, are kind of fun. I have got a lot of mag magnets around the studio for, uh, for different things, and I would um, love to share some of those with you. Um, I know that uh, Julia is going to be joining me here in just a second, so I want to sort of... Um, let her jump in here in a few minutes. And if you've got any magnetic, oh, hey, Tisha, oh my gosh. Um, if you've got any uh, tips or tricks or uh, things like that that you guys do, please feel free to add them in the comments below so that uh, you can share them with everybody else. Um, and we've got uh, a bunch of fun classes coming up that I want to tell you guys about. And it's going to be awesome. So uh, yeah, so, oh, hi, Chris. Hello, I know you've got lots of tips and tricks, especially when it comes to magnets. So, um, let me tell you, uh, and uh, Julia has a couple of good tips for her files that she does as well for magnets. But, you know, having magnets around the studio for all kinds of things is great, just in terms of organization. And, um, and you know, heck, they're just fun to play with. <laughs> so, um, if you, uh, you know, have uh, some really strong, you know, rare earth magnets, um, those can actually hold a lot of weight. And you can get them at, you know, grocery stores, hardware stores, online, you know, uh, you can get them at 7-Eleven. And there are, you know, lots of different shapes and sizes that can be used for all kinds of things. Um, so, um, yeah, if you're using uh, magnets in your studio, like I said, Comment below and let us know how you are doing. Ah, Miguel, hola. <laughs> and uh, let us know how, how you use them and uh, tell me about that. So tool organization is always one of those things I think that uh, most craftspeople and metalsmiths um, are always trying to kind of figure out, you know, whether you're using, you know, pegboards or uh, self-made uh, tool organization things. Um, or just found objects that you have around the studio. You know, there's always something that we're always trying to figure out how to put our tools and get them more organized. I'm going to be organizing this uh, area here soon. Um, but, uh, but my pegboard's pretty organized. And so I've got a lot of um, little uh, tools that are great for you know, hanging hammers and hanging little, you know, uh, pliers and screwdrivers and whatever I happen to have in the studio, um, which I think, let me see if I can flip this around and show you guys. There we go. So yeah, so I've got all kinds of little contraptions and things to hold stuff on the pegboard, right? And trying to get that organized is always uh, a challenge, you know, because you are constantly, you know, updating your tools and getting things put together in different ways. You may run across a new tool that you need to have. But, um, you know, as you add tools to your studio, you want to add functionality to your studio, and organization is really important. Um, one of the things that I usually recommend, you know, this time of year especially, when it's, you know, the new year, and you're, you know, a lot of middlesmiths will come out of the Christmas break in a slump. This is not unusual at all. Um, I was actually talking to some of my, my friends last night, uh, fellow metalsmiths in the Seattle Metals Guild, which is a, a really great supportive group of people, and we were talking about, about this slump that everybody sort of hits after Christmas. You come into the holidays, you are just jazzed from like August to December, trying to get pieces finished, trying to get your show put together, trying to get Christmas sales done, packaging, wrapping, you know, the, the whole nine yards. And you hit Christmas and you know it's all crazy because it's Christmas and then it's like pfft, into the ground so I know a lot of fellow metalsmiths will suffer with um, depression this time of year because they feel like they'll never sell anything again and you're done and what just happened and you're sort of reeling from all of that that craziness that months of craziness so you know you're not alone. It's uh, it is something that is perfectly natural. So if you find yourself uh, feeling like, um, oh my God, what have I done? What have I gotten myself into? 
and your studio's a disaster because you've just spent the last four months before the holidays uh, pulling out every single tool and, and trying to get the work done. Um, I always choose January and February, especially the first couple of weeks of January if I can, to get back into the studio, which feels hard for a lot of people, and take that time to not force myself to have to make things because I've been doing that for the last couple of months nonstop. So if you can take that pause and organize your studio during that time, it feels like you're doing something constructive, you feel like you're settling in, the pieces that you were working on that kind of got pushed to the side can get reorganized and reprioritized. You can, you know, get things, you know, back to sort of um, ground, <laughs> ground zero, so that you can reset for the new year. And I always find that I feel like I'm like, ah, oh, the studio's nice and clean again, and I can go forward and continue um, making new stuff and, and get that momentum back and get back in the studio without feeling guilty. So if I feel like I've got, you know, you, if you feel like you come into the studio and you're like, oh my God, I just can't make another thing. I don't know if it'll ever sell again. So take this time to get organized, right? And uh, straighten things up, get things cleaned up. Now, I like to do that by you know, hitting the hardware store hard. <laughs> so I'll go to Lowe's or I've got a local, uh, a local hardware store that's like walking distance a block away from my studio, which makes it really convenient. And I can go over there, you know, the minute, you know, inspiration strikes and get, uh, you know, tools to sort of, or organizational tools to help me get things put back together in a nice way. Um, and I also choose that time of year to get things moved out. And so if you've got uh, additional tools, you've got new tools, um, perhaps this is a good time of year too to sort of move those tools that you're not using any longer to somebody who can use them. Um, there are a couple of really good options. If you've got a local school that has a high school program that has tools that, you know, they're always looking for new tools because their programs don't have a lot of money budgeted uh, for the arts programs, donate some tools to them. If you've got um, some young people that are coming up behind you that are building their studios and trying to find new things, give some of those additional tools to them and pass that that on, you know, um, just kind of be kind and, and move that on. Also, um, Tim McCrate has a wonderful, who is the author of Complete Metal Smith and several other books, publisher and Metal Smith and all around great guy. Um, Tim has a um, uh, an organization that he does that is um, set up a toolbox initiative so that they take donated tools to jewelers who are in need on the west coast of Africa and he has partnered with a bunch of people in Senegal and Rio Grande has a way that you can donate your your uh, filings and, and scrap metal as well as tools so you can go through Rio Grande to find that donation site if you want to do something like that. But, you know, I guarantee you if you're in this organizational uh, set mindset and you want to sort of get things cleansed and get things organized, this is the best time to do it. It is a renewal for the new year. So, <laughs> I will tell you, it feels good. And fortunately for me, I did this right before, I did, was doing it in February right as we were about to go into the lockdown a couple of years ago, and I had completely redone the studio, and then I was locked in here for like three months. So I guarantee you, if you do it, you're gonna be rewarded in a long way. Also too, taking that time to do that, you're gonna end up finding things like lost stones and <laughs> pieces that hit the floor that you never were able to find. So yeah, give yourself a couple of weeks just to get things organized and straightened out. Give some tools to somebody who needs them, and. Um, get things straight and squared and reprioritized for the new year. Um, so I'm hoping Julia is going to jump on here in just a second and talk with us about the magnetic parts of tool organization because um, I've got a bunch of them that are a lot of fun. Um, like I said, little, you know, uh, rear earth magnets boop, are fantastic to have in the studio because you can use them for, you know, getting things stuck together and getting, getting it so that you've got easy access to grab pieces that you need quickly. Um, a lot of the uh, tool storage is magnetized because things like your drill bits and um, 
birds have a tendency to roll all over the place and having a little magnetic mark or things like that is great because you can stick them right to it. In fact, Fordham makes one that attaches right to the flex shaft stand. So it makes it really easy to swing that arm out and you've got your magnetic bar attached to your flex shaft right where you need it. And they're up off your bench out of the way, which can be another great component when you're trying to organize and make some room on your bench. Um, one of the, the places that used to be here in town that is deeply missed, it has left a huge hole in our community, is um, Hardwick's and Sons Hardware. And for those of you that, that know Hardwick's, um, it was here since 1930 and has was over in the University District and it was one of those really, really old mom and pop hardware stores that had everything under the sun, new and used tools. And if you've got a place like that, a feed and seed or something that has great tools, um, you're gonna find, you know, support those people because they're awesome and they're, they have so many weird, wonderful tools and contraptions that you're gonna love it. Um, I know Brent, when, when we were down in Savannah, Georgia, there are so many great feed and seed stores and, you know, places that you're like, what the heck is this, you know, on the shelf? And they are always fantastic to be able to sort of go in and find things that you never expected that are great organizational uh, uh, things that help you get things kind of organized or um, uh, things like this, the cow magnet. And for those of you who don't know what a cow magnet is, it makes it so that you can stick your cows to the refrigerator. <laughs> no, it actually is. Um, they're kind of like a, a lozenge and they are a really strong magnet that um, in the seed and feed sort of stores, they'll have these um, because back in the day, a lot of cows, especially if they're free range, um, if they're eating stuff that's in the field like uh, scraps of uh, wire and um, uh, any little bits of metal that happen to be you know, in their way while they're grazing will get stuck in their stomach and can make them really sick and they've got so many stomachs that all that stuff has to pass through and it can kill them. So what you can do is get the cow magnet and you put it down its little gullet and it stays in the first stomach and attaches to the magnet so it doesn't pass through their entire system and tear up the inside of the cow. So that's what cow magnets are. Now, cow magnets are incredibly strong and I actually use this for a couple of things. Um, one, um, if you've got a little bit of scrap, it's always a good idea before you recycle any of your scrap to run a magnet through it. And because of the shape of this one and the strength of this one, it makes it really easy just to kind of stir my scrap metal and pull out any little bits of broken tools, uh, like uh, drill bits that have sort of chipped off or uh, teeth from saw blades. So you've got a great way to sort of get in there and suck that stuff out. Um, so usually right before I do any recycling or anything like that, I'll just take my magnets and sweep them through the tin and pull out anything that might be steel. So that just helps to sort of get that stuff out of there before you either melt or recycle the metal in any way. Um, the other thing I like the cow magnet for is for my magnetic pin finisher. Um, a lot of my pieces are really small and it makes it very easy for me to take out just the tiny pins, the steel pins that are in here, and it leaves all my tiny uh, pieces and bindings on the bottom of the bin so I can take them out and sort them out much faster. It saves me so much time. And um, especially if you've got something like, uh, potentially like an earring post that has broken off while they're spinning, it will separate because they're almost exactly the same size. It's really hard to see them. So this makes it real easy to sort out your silver or gold from your, uh, from your steel pins. Um, also, if it gets stuck in those little bits of castings, magnets can be a great way to separate those pins out of your pieces. Um, for filigree and things like that that are delicate and have lots of little nooks and crannies, that magnet can help pull out those little uh, shot pins really quick and easily. Um, and if you drop something on the floor, again, this is another great way to be able to sort of, you know, roll it around or pass it around um, into places that you can't see to pick up things like that, that dropped drill bit. You know, a magnet is a great way to go. So, um, yeah, just having, you know, a nice strong magnet like a cow magnet in the studio is great to go. Um, so, I keep that usually with my, uh, my scrap bin or my pin finisher, which I usually use more often 
and um, just have those two things together and sort things out really quickly. But um, there are other magnets that are additionally helpful uh, because a lot of the tools that we're working with are steel. So I usually have on my bench pin right here, um, I usually have a couple of magnets stuck to the bench pin itself. Now, my bench pin is a clamp-on bench pin, one of the steel bench pins and anvils, and I usually have a nice strong magnet right on the side of my bench pin so I can stick my um, chuck key right to it. This makes it really quick because I always get this tangled on a book or I can't find it on my bench and it makes it real fast and easy just to have it right there on my bench pen. So um, for those of you that may have seen the, the reel with the dancing bench pen, uh, or <laughs> chuck key, um, that's why I usually have those two things together. And a light magnet makes it really easy to just grab it and go. Um, but you're not searching all around your bench or trying to struggle to get it off a hook. Makes it really quick and easy. Um, while I'm working too, um, I will sometimes have a, a small magnet on the back of my bench pin, kind of out of the way, and as I'm filing, and I can sort of tack my file right to the end of my bench pin, do whatever I need, and grab it and keep going. So uh, just having one just sort of hidden on the back side makes it real easy for me just to like da 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 and keep going and just snap, snap it right into place right there and keep going. So it just, again, I'm not having to search for it or grab for it. But for commonly used uh, tools, um, as I'm working, this makes it real easy just to grab it and work and snap it right back into place. Um, the other thing I have is a strong, stronger magnet down underneath uh, on the bench pin that I can snap my saw onto. And so I just have it like snapped right onto the bench pin below, um, or I'll, if I'm not using it, I'll snap it out of the way on a hook. But you know, just having a couple of magnets on your bench pin make it so simple and so easy just to keep things organized and out of the way and accessible and ready to go when you need them. Um, there are always great, you know, uh, bars of magnets to, um, you know, the, oops, everything's stuck to it now. Um, so if you have one of the toolbars like this, um, these are fantastic to have in different locations. Um, you can keep something like this over your wax working station and you know attach your burrs where you need them. Um, I always have a pair of cutters for clipping screws and my wax working tools. So this makes it really easy as I'm working just to grab them and go. Um, I have for years kept all my wax working tools in a, a little cup and I have jabbed myself so many times with those silly things that it is just ridiculous. So I found that a magnetic bar above my work, work area, one, makes it a little bit easier to find the things that I need, and I'm not jabbing them into my hand every time I'm reaching for one. So, um, but yeah, having little little uh, organizational things just attached to a toolbar like this off your bench really makes it pretty easy just to see the things you need and grab them and go. So, there you have it. So, toolbars like this um, are fantastic. Um, and I'm hoping, Julia, if you're out there, um, to sign in because her uh, big tip is she has a toolbar that is a magnetic uh, toolbar. And what she will do is uh, she's covered hers with cloth because she'll use it for her files. And with the files, you don't want to damage them on a really strong magnet or the metal that's there. You don't want to damage the teeth. So a lot of metalsmith friends of mine will use something to cover the uh, steel that's on the magnetic bars to put their, uh, their files on. Uh, that way they are not damaging the teeth, they have all their uh, files organized right where they can see them, and um, by putting a piece of cloth or cork or uh, wood veneer or something over the, the magnetic bar, it's going to extend the life of those tools, uh, make it a little bit easier to get the tools on and off, and if it's an extremely strong magnetic bar like this one is, um, it can, you know, when you put those teeth on there, it can dent them and damage them. So over time, it'll wear them down. So what I like to use on mine is this stuff. This is actually a duct tape that has, that's cork. I know, I love this stuff. Um, so duct tape cork, and it's adhesive on the back, and I can stick it to whatever I need, and it gives me a really nice soft uh, surface. So I have my strong magnet underneath, 
and here we go, strong magnet underneath, and here we go. And you can attach your tools really simply. So, and without damaging them. So, duck, this is really super thin too. It's only like maybe a millimeter, not even a millimeter thick. So it's pretty thin, but it's a nice soft surface. And easy to change, easy to update, and, uh, and you're good to go. So I picked this up at the hardware store as well with the, the other duct tape. They've got all kinds of, of great stuff. And any duct tape is gonna work pretty well for you. So it will you know, give you some resistance that is not gonna have your tools right up against that metal piece. Um, so those are my tips on the uh, magnets and, uh, and I hope you guys, oh wait, but wait, there's more. I almost forgot. This was the whole inspiration. So little spice jars. So these are magnet magnets on the bottom and they have like a little magnetic pad and they snap onto a steel board. They're usually found for like kitchen organization. I got mine on Amazon for about 25 bucks and I like the big, big surface ones. And they have a little window on the front of them and I can use my label maker to put whatever's on the inside. So this is great for small part storage, but I'm using mine for solder and it's directly over my solder station. And, um, and if you look at the, uh, the page here, hello, let me flip that around, there we go. So yeah, so I've got it right over my solder station there and uh, right where I need it, easy to reach and nice little spice tins are organized. So there you have it, um, little spice tins, great magnetic solution to help you get organized in the new year. Um, you can also get uh, steel uh, pieces like this and buy the little spice tins and magnetic tins separately and use this to attach your tools and keep organized that way. So this just bolts right to your wall and you're good to go. So a couple of magnets and put your tools on there. Everything looks really clean and organized. Leave yourself some notes on there. Some of these are like dry board material as well. So you can kind of put your <laughs> right file and there you have it. Um, but things like this are just great this time of year to get organized, feel like you've done some work in the studio, get set for the new year and give yourself this time to breathe. You know, give yourself some self-care this time of year and um, reach out to other metalsmiths that you might know, say hi and ask them if they're okay too uh, and what they're doing to kind of like start the new year over again and get reset. Uh, I know a lot of people are just like taking a big, big sigh, deep breath to uh, get ready for February and spring and summer and getting ready for shows. And this is the time to sort of get set and, and clean up, organize, and uh, plan your new gear. And, um, but yeah, de definitely reach out to some other metalsmiths just to see if they're okay. Have some coffee, say hi, and, uh, and reach out to your community. There you go. Um, so coming up, we've got uh, a couple of classes. Uh, Saturday, Flex Shaft Tips and Tricks are coming up. So if you are interested in all the things that the Flex Shaft can do, I am your gal. Um, I can, if you just got a Flex Shaft or uh, don't have a Flex Shaft or a rotary tool that you're not sure because you don't know what they do, they seem weird and expensive and you're like, I don't know, I don't, I, I can hand drill or, you know, something. They're more than just a hand drill. It's got so much potential. You can turn it into a belt sander, a hammer hand piece, an engraving tool. Um, and a lathe and so much more. So Saturday, we've got a couple of seats left in the Flex Shaft class if you wanna join us. Um, I'll also talk about finishing tips and tricks and all the little bobs and what they do. So join us Saturday for that. Um, also two, Julia is gonna be doing files. Um, oh, hey, um, is there a problem? I don't have uh, a touch yet. Uh, oh, a torch yet. Uh, wanting to take the Flex Shaft class. No, absolutely not. This is a great way, a great time actually to take the Flex Shaft class because I'm gonna educate you on what they are, what they do, which ones are gonna be the right one for you. Um, you may only need a Dremel. You may only need something that's like a, a real easy thing. Um, but, you know, um, yeah, yeah, my torch, I got it. <laughs> yes, um, but you know, a lot of people are cold working their studios. 
and actually the flex shaft was the first piece of equipment that I bought when I was uh, a youngling starting out because I needed it to drill holes, twist wire, and, and polish things. And it was the, the best tool for all of that um, with one investment. So it's an incredibly versatile tool, um, but before you overindulge and get something more powerful than you need or you know, not powerful enough, come into the class and, and let's talk about that because um, I can really help you sort out what you need and why and what makes sense and what seems like it's just too over the top, right? There are really inexpensive solutions and, um, and there's some really fancy ones. But, uh, but yeah, join me for that on Saturday. Um, also, Julia's gonna be doing the Files Demystified class and honestly, I have sat in on this class and Julia has blown my mind. Um, I've been working with files as most of you probably have for years. I mean, a file's a file, right? No. Um, Julia has a nine page handout on files that is so in depth and taught me so many things about files that I didn't know um, about the cuts, about who makes what, how to attach the handle properly, and just what the difference is in all the different cuts and sizes and numbers and letters and you know, all that. So, um, if you haven't if you're, if you're starting out, or even if you've been in the studio for a long time, both of those classes are really good because they will really open your eyes to um, stuff that you may not be aware of that's really incredibly helpful. So, uh, Files Demystified and Flex Shaft Tips and Tricks. So both of those are awesome. Um, also, too, I'll be starting wax carving next week on Wednesday. So, I am real excited to be doing the wax carving class back online again. Uh, I've been teaching uh, wax carving and casting locally here, and so I don't do it online when I'm doing it locally, and I'm really happy to do it online again. We had people from all over North America last time we did this, um, so I can help you figure out what all the waxes are, what the tools are, what you need, um, where you can get things cast, what can cast, because there's not everything's needing to be cast, um, and we'll also touch on some stone setting and more. So join us for that. Um, the nice thing about wax carving for those of you that are just starting out in a studio too, you don't need a torch, you don't need a lot of equipment, all you need are some just basic carving tools and files and sandpaper and it's very inexpensive and so I would highly recommend that. Also, yes, uh, Tisha, yes exactly, uh, Julia is teaching the Sparks class and for those of you again that are sort of on a slump and are like, I don't know what I'm doing, it's January. Um, the Sparks class is great. Julia gives you uh, several little tips and tricks along the way, but basically what happens is she sends you a prompt each day during the, the term, and it's kind of like a writer's prompt to get you into the studio. So you sit down and, and do whatever it is, and usually the little prompts are things to give you a project that will uh, start um, a little project that'll take 45 minutes, an hour, or however long you want. But it gets you back to the bench and gets you thinking about solving problems. And then once a week, they meet, show what they've done, how they solve these problems, and touch base, talk, and uh, and talk about how things could get done differently, or you know what tool tips that she's got for you as well. And also, coming up, um, if Chris is still here, uh, from Lion Punch Forge, I uh, do love my, um, hand engrave or the engraving tools that attach to the flex shaft from Lion Punch Forge. So it turns your flex shaft into uh, an engraving tool, an impact engraver. So it's a nice in-between between hand engraving and the power gravers and uh, it's a great way to sort of get some texture, do some engraving, and uh, do some basic stone setting. So that's going to be on the 22nd. So if you guys want to join us uh, please do. Oh, I think, uh, let's see, where is Julia? Oh, Julia is Bush. She's been teaching all day, so she's not going to be joining us. But, um, but we've got lots of classes coming up. Oh, and Etch in a Bag. Julia's going to be teaching Etch in a Bag again on February 26th. And, oh, oh, oh my God, it's awesome. So you don't have to have a lot of space for equipment. Um, you don't have to work with anything that's too dangerous. You're basically using a um, a light kind of acid in uh, a bag, a Ziploc bag, and etching your pieces, and then you can 
like, yeah, etch your pieces in brass or copper. And then if you have a rolling mill, it's great because you can use it for textures and stuff. So Etch in a Bag is coming up February 26th as well. And I hope you will join us for those classes. So get yourself some magnets, <laughs> get yourself some coffee, join a friend, talk about organizing your studio and your plans for the year and kind of what you're wanting to do. Um, but do reach out to a friend and say hi and check in on them um, because I know everybody is exhausted and needing a break and needs some self-care and needs to organize. So go do that and have fun and we will see you next week for Tool Tips on Tuesday. So, bye my babies. Have a great evening. We'll see you later. Bye.